Let the Galaxy Burn Narrated by a Border Prince Small Cogs by Neil Rutledge Colonel Soft believed in order, in preparation and attention to detail. But as he stood by the shining silver doors of the water temple, he felt far from prepared for the coming battle. True, his face was always somewhat drawn, his sparse flesh stretched tightly over his bones, his body all sinew and muscle, no more room for padding on his frame than there was for luxury in his austere life. And his dark eyes flickered relentlessly around the rocky bowl in which the temple stood, but this too was quite normal. The colonel, rigid and controlled, did not readily display his emotions, and only those who knew him well could have detected the slightest signs of anxiety. The sporadic running of his wiry fingers through his tight, greying curls, the thin lips compressed even more tightly, and occasionally barely audible sniff as he straightened his dress uniform. His dress uniform. That indeed was one of his irritations. Perhaps it was fortunate that his unit of the Alberian 13th was on ceremonial guard duty for the Water Temple Festival when the Infernal Eldar raided. At least they were able to deploy quickly to secure the area. But to be going to war in their dress uniforms, the splendid attire of a bygone age, clumping old-fashioned boots, the traditional white fibre cloth itching at the neck and cuffs and the gleaming, lovingly polished pectorals, it was ridiculous. No helmet, no webbing. Praise be to the Emperor that they always paraded armed and with a full complement of heavy weapons, but a slight clenching of his long fingers was another cue to the Colonel's worry as he reflected that the ammunition was not plentiful. He trusted their headquarters would get some reinforcements to them soon. In the meantime, they would manage with what they had. The enemy worried him too, the mysterious Eldar. What were they doing here on the agri world of Luxorus Beta? Colonel Soth was an experienced and well-trained officer, but other than the Orc pirates his men had defeated to liberate this planet two years previously, he had never faced aliens before, nor had any of his men. They had manuals, training materials and hollow exercises, but these were not reality. Even the supposedly simplistic Orcs had constantly produced harrowing surprises in action. What would the inhumanly sophisticated Eldar do? Routine practice and experience, produced confident warriors. This had long been one of Colonel Soft's basic maxims, but they had no experience against this foe. Lack of practice and experience meant uncertainty, and uncertainty meant fear. Soft remembered the nervous eyes of the young Lasgunner catching his, and the boy's anxious question. Do they really skin their captives alive, sir? With an outward calm, which did not entirely reflect his inner feelings, the colonel had reassured the guardsman. Such barbarity, he had explained, was not practised by these Eldar, and besides, if the guardsman followed orders and shot straight, no alien would capture them anyway. Colonel Soft was almost confident in his advice. From what he had gleaned, these were not the so-called Dark Eldar, the notorious piratical renegades. But then, what was the difference? They were all aliens. All humanity's enemies. He mentally castigated himself for such futile speculation and was about to return to his command post when a soft footfall behind him made him stop and turn. It was the priest from the temple, Gerendar. He was a tall man. In his full ceremonial costume, he had a striking figure. Even in the shade of the temple portico, his long white kilt gleamed and the elaborate gold pectoral set with rubies to form the symbol of the ecclesiarchy glinted brightly, catching the light reflected from the huge doors. As Soph looked into the priest's face, he was struck by a similar effect. The man had a strong jaw and jutting nose, and though his gaze was even, there was a sense of mask strength and confidence. A strength more than spiritual, the colonel thought, as he noted how the heavy gold and red leather headdress spread down across powerful shoulders, more like those of a labourer or a warrior than a priest. The Emperor's light shine upon you, the priest greeted informally. The worship of the Divine Emperor here on Luxorus had acquired its own unique trappings in the 1800 years since it had first been settled, but its people were devoted servants nonetheless. And also on you, 
Soph replied. Are your defences prepared, Colonel? Is there more my servants or I can do to assist you? The priest's voice was calm, Soph noted with approval. He had courage, even on the verge of an alien attack. We are as ready as we can be. The colonel gestured towards his gleaming parade boots with his gilded ceremonial baton. But we are not exactly conventionally attired for action. There was another slight sniff. Who can fully understand the will of the emperor? Gerendar asked. Had it not been for the festival, you would not have been here to deploy to protect us. As you said yourself, if the cursed Eldar realise the irrigation controls are here, and they can flood the levels to impede our reinforcements, they will certainly attempt to capture the temple. It is not an orderly way to conduct a defence. Soft spoke almost to himself. We are not properly attired or equipped. Properly attired? The priest smoothed his kilt. These garments go back to the dark days of our slavery to the orcs, before the Emperor gathered us once more to his bosom. Praise him always. Yet even in those terrible times, some were able to resist. And, he added, pointing at the rubies on his pectoral, these garments are marked now with the symbols of the Emperor's constancy. Even when we struggle alone, we are not forgotten. Why is this temple here, Colonel Soph? It is to thank the Emperor for his blessings in giving us the means to control the irregular reigns of this harsh land, so that we may offer him this land's bounty. In the short term, we may see difficulties. In the long term, the Emperor cares for his children. Sof was irritated, and was even more annoyed that he could not control his irritation in the presence of this calm priest. But how? he asked sharply. Can a commander exercise proper control without even adequate comlinks? He tapped the low-powered wrist communicator he was wearing to emphasise his point. The priest pointed to where his servant, a young novice, stood by one of the pillars of the portico. Rigeth, my servant, he understands. He knows he is only a novice, a servant, a minute component in the Emperor's divine plan. We priests in charge of temples, or colonels in charge of regiments, are inclined to forget that we are merely servants too, only one tiny piece in the Emperor's great whole. Would you allow your men to question? A sudden shrieking whine and burst of laser fire from the great ridge above them cut off the priest's homily. Eldar! Soft spat. It's begun. Get to safety. I must reach my command post. Leaving the priest, he began sprinting up the slope to where he had set up his headquarters on the rocky edge. The section of the ridge surrounding the depression in which the temple sat was not the steepest. To gain some cover, Soft kept off the road, but the surrounding terrain was rough. He needed to concentrate on his footing, and so he raced on. He dared only to glance around himself from time to time, sporadically catching sight of the blurs of red screaming along the edge of the crest. Their progress, marked by the staccato spurts of rock dust, the ghastly screech of projectiles ricocheting off the boulders, was audible, even over the shriek of their engines. These, he assumed, were the Eldar's notorious jet bikes, a first wave of attack to soften up his defences and keep his men's heads down. He paused just before the lip of the Great Ridge, crouching against a boulder. The tumbled rocks of the ridge offered good cover, and he could see the bright stab of Lasgun fire as his troops offered up some form of defence. Praying that the Eldar weren't trying some form of jamming against his own dress-issue communicator would be useless. He barked into his wrist unit. Soft to Captain Hoddish! Hoddish receiving, sir. The captain's voice was crisp even over the box link. Pass the orders to cease Lasgun fire against the jet bikes. We haven't the ammunition to waste. The colonel continued up the slope, his teeth clenched. He could hear Hoddish using the command Voxlink. Hoddish to all units. No Lasgun fire on jet bikes. Don't waste power against those lightning spirits. Save it for the infantry. The jet bikes continued their attack passes, and Soph had to hurl himself behind a boulder as one craft hurtled straight for him its projectiles singing an unearthly war cry as they fragmented the rock all around him. He caught a split-second glimpse of the alien's helmet as its craft howled overhead. This was certainly a far cry from fighting orcs. Even the very sounds of battle were different. Now, as he approached the top of the ridge, the enemy fire was more intense, but the Eldar were not having things all their own way. As one large jet craft tore across the wide depression, there was a flash and a spurt of smoke as a missile was launched by the fire team posted on the ornate roof of the ancient temple. 
The Eldar craft jerked sharply and dived to the far rim of the rocky bowl, but Soft watched the flare of the missile as it blasted towards the enemy, guiding True to catch the vehicle and detonated with a thunderous explosion just short of the crest. The blazing wreckage seemed to fall in mesmerising slow motion, and it was only with some effort that Soft managed to tear his eyes away and dash for the summit. Amidst a series of blasts from some unseen enemy's heavy weapon down to the far side of the Great Slope, the colonel dived into his hastily improvised command post. There, amidst the slightly better shelter of the hurriedly piled rocks and scraped depressions, no textbook trench could be dug in this terrain, Colonel Soff rapidly appraised himself of the developing attack. He led sound troops and they held a strong defensive perimeter, commanding both the Temple Depression and its surrounding approaches. If it hadn't been for their lack of proper equipment and the unknown nature of their enemy, he would have been as confident as any Imperial Guard officer should dare to be. Crouched under the shadow of a huge sandy-coloured boulder, he hastily conferred with Hoddish and his other staff, while the command commute link operator, a small, leathery-skinned veteran of many anti-pirate operations with the Albaran 13th, coolly passed to them updates from other sections, as best as their limited equipment allowed. I do not think they are fully pressing us yet, sir, Hoddish was saying when a deathly howl followed by a rattling storm of shrapnel and rock fragments made all the men suddenly crouch even lower. Hoddish grinned as the noise subsided, patting a long tear in the still smartly creased sleeve of his dress jacket. His round face had always struck Soph as peculiarly boyish, with his thin moustache only serving to further the impression of a youth trying to pass as a man. He had a cool head, though, and continued unperturbed. The main attack has yet to develop, this is just to soften us up. There do not seem to be many enemy, and they do not appear to have much armour or heavy weaponry. The best information we can gain from Central Command is that the whole assault is some form of raid rather than an invasion. I suggest our opponents are a force dispatched to attempt to flood the levels to stop our armour from getting into action. I expect they will press all our perimeter from the air, but concentrate on the ground, attempting a breakthrough at just one point. Here, perhaps, Sof mused out loud. We have the widest view, but it is the easiest section of the ridge to break through. Yes, sir, the captain agreed. As if on cue, there was a shout from a nearby trooper. Enemy advancing, sir! Soth crawled forward cautiously. The slopes of the ridge raked back on both sides of the spur on which he had located his command post, but the guardsman who had called the warning gestured down the left slope. He was another young man, and he looked pale, his knuckles showing white where they gripped his melter gun. His cap was jammed down ridiculously tight on his head, perhaps to try to shield his ears from the ghastly racket of the jet bikes. Sir, he looked nervously at the colonel. Yes, guardsman. They're not really spirits, are they, sir? Soph was mystified. Explain yourself. The flying Eldar, sir. They're not spirits, are they? Suddenly the words of Hoddish's warning not to waste ammunition against the flying craft came back to Soph. He looked the young guardsman in the eye. No, they are not spirits. Captain Hoddish spoke only figuratively. Did you not see the one down by the missile? And guardsman? Yes, sir. Straighten your cap. Yes, sir. The young man showed a slight smile as he carried out the colonel's order. Soph scrutinised the scene down the slope. He didn't have viewers, but Hoddish passed him a lasgun with a targeter, and he was able to search for the enemy more effectively. The slope was a mass of tumbled rock, dotted with thorny scrub. It made good concealment for them, but also offered the enemy ample cover for a cautious advance. Soph forced himself to concentrate carefully amidst the growing barrage along their section of ridge. They were coming all right. Overhead, the jet bike sweep seemed to intensify yet further. The colonel doubted if they were causing many casualties, but they were keeping the guardsmen from grouping to counter the mounting attack. Pass the order to hold fire until range band amber. He instructed Hodish, without taking his eye from the target. Heavy weapons to target armour or support troops only. He could pick out occasional movements, but no clear targets. Suddenly, further along the ridge, some form of dreadnought or similar fighting machine appeared from behind a tangle of thorns. There was the crackling whoosh of a las cannon shot from their left, and beyond that the staccato tattoo of a heavy bolter. But with frightening speed, the machine strode across some open ground, and with a grace more organic, the mechanised vaulted into a gully and out of sight. The colonel could hear young guardsmen swearing nervously beside him. In truth, 
Soth could remember scant details of such machines, but said clearly, loud enough for the Melter Gunner to hear, An Eldar Dreadnought, fast but poorly armoured. They always suffer at shorter ranges. There were increasing signs of movement down slope, and the Eldar infantry were starting to open fire. The air was full of the whine of their strange projectiles, and sharp cracks as they ricocheted off the rock. As they came closer, the storm intensified and the guardsmen began to reply. Soph nodded approval to himself at the disciplined nature of his men's firing. The Eldar advance slowed, but now under cover of the fire of their supporting infantry and the continuing howling passes of the jet bikes, a new threat showed. In several places, turrets were rising above scrub patches and rocky outcrops, and a torrent of heavy fire was poured on the guardsmen. A deadly duel began between the well-placed and concealed cannons of the guards and the bobbing and weaving grav tanks of the Eldar. And all the time, the alien infantry pressed gradually closer. The guardsmen were taking casualties, but the constant drill and practice that Colonel Soff had always insisted on was paying off. One grav tank exploded, setting ablaze the patch of scrub in which it had been inadequately concealed. The smoke drifted across their front, and under this cover the strange dreadnought machine ventured out of the gully, only to be caught in a torrent of heavy bolter fire that buckled one of its legs, tumbling it back into the gulch. The enemy continued to advance, however, and suddenly the storm of doom broke loose. The jet bikes broke off, but the remainder of the aliens charged, firing their bizarre weapons as they came. The guardsmen poured down a fusillade of fire, but still the tide surged up the slope. One more grav tank exploded away to the left, but almost directly in front of them, another whined forward, weapons blazing as it outstripped its escorting infantry. In the Emperor's name, where is that last cannon? Hoddish was shouting. The tank was getting closer, heading for a dip in the crest, the red-armoured alien troops storming after it. Soth grabbed the melter gun of the young guardsman beside him. Cover me, he cried as he sprinted across the slope. He could hear shouts behind him and lasgun bolts echoing off the rocks, but it was the sudden zing of Eldar projectiles around him that he was most conscious of as he ran, desperate to cut across the advance of the grav tank and get close enough for a shot. He was closing the range when something snatched at his leg and he fell, tumbling wildly down the slope. With a painful tearing, he was brought up, caught fast in a thorn bush, staring at the red wall of the passing grav tank. Too shocked even to aim properly, he raised the melter gun and fired. There was the distinctive hiss and then a crashing as the blast tore into the plates at the rear of the alien vehicle, which whined on by. Soth could see an Eldar approaching and struggled to free himself from a thorn bush to bring the melter gun to bear. The alien figure was raising its long, strangely fashioned weapon, its tall, almost insectoid helmet, a blank mask of menace. But before it could fire, there was a flash on its chest as it was hit and it dropped. There was a fusillade of fire from behind Soth as the guardsman counterattacked. The colonel found his arm grabbed by the young guardsman whose weapon he had snatched. The youth was shouting and waving his pistol as, with his other hand, he helped Soth out of the bush. You got it, sir! You got the tank! But he had no time to say more before two of the red aliens charged them. Soth dropped back to his knees as a shot knocked the melter gun from his hand. His young companion managed to drop one of the Eldar with his pistol, and the other was dispatched by a bayonet of a huge sergeant with a bold and scarred head, almost as inhuman as the alien's helmets. The firing and the tumult of battle continued, but it faded slightly and moved downhill. The enemy was being driven back. Soth, eagerly assisted by the young guardsman, took cover behind a jagged boulder and examined his leg where he had been hit. There was a good deal of blood on his own, now less than pristine dress trousers, but he had been fortunate and the wound was only a long gash across his calf. Lacking his webbing and full kit, he had to improvise a dressing with cloth torn from his shirt. Even so, he managed to staunch the bleeding and prepared himself for action once more. The hiss and whine of the Eldar infantry's weapons was less noticeable now, but the air was once more filled with the awful howl of the jet bikes as they shriek back to the attack. Back to the command post, Soth ordered his men, and keep your heads down. It was a short stretch to cover, but it was a tense dash, as they raced back to the improvised headquarters. Captain Hoddish knew his commander too well. To waste time on congratulating him on the destruction of the grav tank, he merely grinned his boyish grin, and after a simple, 
Good to see you back here, sir. Quickly updated the colonel on the situation. They had taken some casualties. Ammunition was holding, for the present, but the Eldar had probably only paused in their assault. If they were to impede the Imperial advance and gain benefit from flooding the levels, their enemy would have to move fast. The sun was beginning to sink and throw long, jagged shadows across the rocks and thorns. The low light brought an astonishing warmth to the reds, sand yellows and ochres of the broken terrain. It was a harsh land, but under this light it achieved a mellow beauty that struck even the practical soft. But there was no time for pondering on such beauty now. The rich, blue sky of evening was suddenly full of the streaking red of the jet bikes once more, and the colonel again had some anxious moments as he made his way to inspect their positions prior to the expected second alien attack. Of particular concern to him was the last cannon emplacement that had been silent. He had feared the crew were dead, but finally, after crawling and sliding through the jagged rocks and grasping thorns, he reached their position and found the men alive. Coated in sweat and dust, a stocky corporal was feverishly stripping the weapon mounting down. His fellow crewman, foreman and tunic front stained with oil, was examining the components closely. Praise the throne, I have it, he shouted, his proud face a picture of relief. Sighing and weeping the sweat from his forehead, he only succeeded in smearing his face with oil. Wide-eyed with delight, he presented more the aspect of an ancient barbarian than a smart guardsman. Both men looked up to notice Soph at the same time, and simultaneously they moved to stand and salute. At ease, Soth ordered curtly, waving them to stay put. What have you got, trooper? Grit, sir, the oil-smeared guardsman replied. It was jamming the transverse cog. How did you get grit out in the traverse gears? The colonel's voice was sharp and full of meaning. I don't know, sir. It must have been as we emplaced. The gunner's voice had acquired a slightly nervous edge. Soph was a strict officer, and the lads' cannon's failure to track the grav tank had jeopardised both their own position and their colonel's life. There was a short pause before Soph asked. Carelessness, gunner? Yes, sir. It was the corporal who spoke now. He was still on his knees, but he had stiffened to a sort of attention. Eyes rigidly front, his strong jaw thrust out but caked in grime and his dark curls blonde with dust. He made a bizarre picture. He continued quickly. I must have rushed too much while in place in the gun, sir. The colonel gave one of his soft sniffs of irritation. This whole action was so disorderly. These are difficult conditions, corporal, but that makes attention to detail even more important. It is often the smallest cogs that are the most important. Neatness, care, dedication, these are all as necessary to a guardsman of the Emperor as being able to shoot straight. The slight flicker of a smile cracked the flat face of the other gunner. Soph swung round at him at once. Yes, soldier! The man instantly stiffened too. Sorry, sir. I was just thinking that we are not too neat just now, sir. Soph clenched his fingers. No, soldier. But we can still maintain our weapons even if our uniforms suffer. Get this cannon reassembled and let me see your training pay off. Yes, sir, both men chorused, and Soft continued his rounds with caution. As the colonel was heading carefully back to the command post, the jet bike's passes seemed to ease once more, and a rising thunder of last fire from over the ridge heralded a further elder attack. Soft had climbed higher to just beyond the ridge top in an attempt to find a path where he could make faster progress. Now, with the aerial attack switched to other sections of the ridge, he risked less cover and managed to jog and scramble along just below the crest. It was still tough going and the sting from his flesh wound made him wince as he scrabbled up out of a gully. Still, there was a smooth section ahead and he was prepared to chance a dash across it. As he stood on the gully edge, he unconsciously moved to straighten his uniform, readjusting the bronze pectoral on his chest. It was a misplaced gesture of habit, but it saved the colonel's life. As he moved, the bronze plate, something slammed into it with a sharp shock and hiss. It was more a reflex action than the impact that hurled Soph back over the lip of the gully. A sniper. His brain whirled as he instinctively switched his position, sliding and slipping as carefully as he could, following the gully downhill again. How had an alien sniper penetrated their position? 
as Soft pulled himself up to where an overhanging thorn bush offered some chance of concealment for a cautious reconnaissance, he glanced at the small melted hole in the pectoral. He had no doubt that embedded in that hole was a deadly toxic dart. When the attack had first started, he had considered discarding the pectoral, but his own sense of neatness and propriety had stopped him. After all, it was part of the regulation dress uniform. The Emperor would be praised for his own fastidiousness. All this spun through Soft's mind as, with the utmost caution, his last pistol ready in his hand, he pulled himself up behind the thorn bush. His view was restricted, but he gained a reasonable grasp of the sweep of the slope in front of him. The most likely place of concealment for the alien was another patch of stunted thorn slightly up slope from where he watched. The ground was relatively open, as he had noted previously. It would be hard for his adversary to move without being spotted. But then what of those camellia lying cloaks he recalled from long past training? As he pondered, straining his eyes for any clue to the alien's whereabouts, a brief movement caught his eye, a quick reddish flick behind a rock. Soft's vision, long used to the arid terrain and hardened wildlife of his homeland, at once discounted it as one of the large chaser lizards that laired amongst these tumbling boulders. Just a lizard, but what had startled it? He carefully scoured the area, around where he had seen the creature move. Each rock and tuft of dried vegetation was scrutinised, every shadow evaluated. Got it. Only Soft's long training and habitual discipline prevented a hiss of amazement from escaping his compressed lips. As it was, his grip tightened involuntarily on his last pistol. It seemed a rock had moved. Now that he had spotted the alien, it was easier to track its weary progress. Its camouflage was truly incredible, making it almost impossible to spot as, crouching almost double, it crept across the rocks. Are they really spirits, sir? The young guardsman's words came back to him. It would be easy to believe. To be moving thus across the open, the alien probably thought him dead, but it obviously retained some caution. It was too far away for Soft to risk a shot with his pistol. He would somehow have to get closer. One pistol-armed guard colonel in ragged dress uniform against a near-invisible, needle-rifle-toting and possibly armoured alien. He didn't give much for his chances. His best hope was to drop back into the gully, crawl higher up the slope and pray he could spot the Eldar by peering from behind the larger boulder there. All the time he hadn't taken his eyes off the ghostly progress of the alien. But now he was going to have to. He judged the sniper's line of progress as best he could and inched back into the gully. He felt the prickle of sweat on over his palms where he gripped the last pistol and his heart thumped in his ribs as he moved, carefully judging each step back up the small gorge. It seemed agonisingly slow progress, but eventually he was in place to risk a glance from behind the boulders. Setting his cap to one side and holding his breath, he peered round. No dart pierced him, but, look as he might, he could see no sign of the alien. A knot began to form in his stomach, when there was a sudden crackle and voice beside him. Hottish to Colonel Soff! His communicator crackled. There was a sudden confusion of the rocks almost directly ahead of him, as if his vision had blurred for a second. Reflexively, Soft fired. Hottish to Colonel Soff! Are you all right, sir? Hottish to Colonel Soff! The Colonel, somewhat shaken, raised his wrist communicator. Soft receiving. I'm fine, Captain. We are holding the enemy, sir, but ammunition is depleting. I'll be with you shortly, Captain. Take extreme care to be alert for infiltrating snipers, and ensure the men are warned also. I've just bagged an alien scout. Soft out. The colonel had heard rather than seen the Eldar fall, but by looking carefully, he could now make out the body only partially covered by the concealing cloak. The needle rifle had fallen separately, and he could see its oddly graceful stock protruding from some dried weeds. The alien appeared dead, but Soft took no chances, and, keeping his pistol trained on the body, he advanced carefully. Soft stood over the body of the dead scout, staring down at the strangely flowing features of the alien's respirator mask. These Eldar devils made him shudder. The neat hole in the creature's forehead, burned by his last pistol shot, seemed a more natural eye than the opalescent crystal lenses beneath it. The lowering sun cast strong shadows amongst the harsh, tumbled rocks, and even dead and prone at his feet, the chameleon cloak broke up the Eldar's outline in a most disconcerting fashion. The colonel concentrated on the more clearly defined respirator mask, 
but the sun's rays, lacing over the yellow heights, made the iridescent lenses flicker with eerie life, and he turned away. Soft knew he should get back to the battle, the fury of which he heard just down slope beyond the boulders. It had been a close-run thing, and he was content to snatch a moment's rest. He was still breathing heavily, but more importantly, something was nagging him, jabbing the back of his mind with anxiety and the pit of his stomach with persistent adrenaline. How had the scout infiltrated their perimeter? In an unconscious gesture of order, he straightened the life-saving pectoral on his chest and started as if a revelation had come directly from the metal itself. The grav tank. Who had cleared it? A ghastly dread washed over him as he sprinted across the steep slope of the bowl towards the still gently smoking wreck. Dust and small stones skittered from under his boots as he gingerly negotiated the steep flow of the scree across which the enemy tank had ploughed before landing against the rock spire. The Falcon was clearly a wreck. It had spun around to face up the slope and the front end was burnt out. The rear seemed less damaged, however, and it was to hear that Sof carefully made his way, the sharp edges of the rock scratching his hands, the stink from the burnt vehicle scouring his nostrils. The door of the internal compartment hung slightly ajar. Prudence dictated proper clearance procedure, but the colonel was on his own, and besides, he reckoned it was too late now for prudence. He confidently expected to find something more awful, in its own way, than an armed and lurking Eldar. Steadying himself against the rock spire, last pistol at the ready, he kicked the hanging door aside. Cursing, he lost his balance as the door seemed to bounce from his foot. What hellish stuff did these aliens build their vehicles from? It certainly wasn't the weighty metal of their own chimeras, but no attack from within caught him off guard. Instead, he stared at the charred and twisted bodies of more Eldar scouts. Most still sat strapped in their seats in death. One, torn free by the mad careening of the doomed vehicle, was flung, mangled, against his comrades. This time, Soft's eyes were not held by the blank stare of the alien's respirator masks. They were riveted to the empty seats. He desperately counted and recounted. Five empty seats. One scout torn free. One killed by him. There were still three of the devils alive out there, and he knew where they would be heading. Colonel Soft gazed down at the distant water temple, Thinking furiously, three camouflaged alien snipers, the temple, covered by the guards' ridge-top heavy weapons, was defended by only an anti-aircraft section. From his experience with the alien heretic, Soft didn't doubt that the three remaining Eldar could easily evade or dispatch the unwitting guardsmen. He must act fast. Quickly, he radioed Hoddish. How pressed are you, Captain? It's quite tough, sir. The statement was given in Hoddish's usual cheerful manner. But Soft knew that this mild phrase meant that the guards were under heavy attack. Ammunition is getting low, but we're holding out. Hoddish, I'm sure our perimeter has been breached by three alien scouts, and they will attempt to infiltrate the water temple. Use the command link to alert missile teams there. Warn them that the enemy are extremely difficult to locate due to their camouflage cloaks, and that their weapons are silent. Spare me just three men, experienced guardsmen, and I'll attempt to contain the situation. Get them to bring an extra las gun. I'm just over the ridge from you. Hold up by the wrecked grav tank. Yes, sir. I'll dispatch them at once. Soft racked his brains to try to think of how best to combat the alien scouts. As he pondered, he threw away his officer's cap and stripped some of the more prominent braid from the grimy tatters that had so recently been his best uniform. There was no point in providing the alien devils with an even more obvious target than he already was. Appearing like this and carrying a standard lasgun, he hoped he would not stand out from the other men. Soft was no coward, but he wanted to deal with the alien scum personally. As he straightened up from checking the makeshift dressing on his leg, he caught sight of the men Hoddish had sent to assist him. They skittered and slid briskly down the loose scree, before jogging up and saluting. Sergeant Tarsis, reporting for duty, sir. It was the bold and scarred NCO who had led the countercharge that had saved Soft that afternoon. This afternoon, it seemed like an age ago. Soft was pleased with Hoddish's choice. The sergeant was a tough customer and a veteran of several operations against the Orcs. He was an expert in close combat and fairly bulged out of the white cloth of his uniform, which he had somehow managed to preserve in a far neater state than his comrades. 
Tarsus had a reputation for ferocity that went beyond the wild looks given to him by his heavy brows, the missing right ear and the pale scar that twisted across his cheek and chin. But as he handed Sarf a lasgun, his face was as calm as if on parade. Also Corporal Nibaf and Guardsman Sokoff, sir. Guardsman Sokoff specially volunteered to assist you, sir. Both the men saluted. Nibiff was another veteran, a short man but of the same wiry build as Sop himself. He had a calm sureness in his stance and movement, even on the loose scree, and the colonel noted with interest the sniper's badge on the torn sleeve of his tunic. Sokoff was the young melter gunner who had rescued Sof from the brush. He was inexperienced, but he had certainly acquitted himself well on that occasion. There was an eagerness in his thin face and bright eyes as he saluted. Sof had seen such devotion before in many young recruits. He hoped the lad was not to pay heavily for his keenness. They moved off as rapidly as they could over the difficult terrain, Sof issuing orders for the advance on the temple as they went. There was a plan, but a sketchy one. The kind of plan Sof hated, and had often chided junior officers for on, on exercise. Too much was being left to chance, but they had been caught on parade by this ghostly enemy, and their options were severely limited. Not even Tarsus had any form of comlink, and Sof judged it prudent that they should operate as one group to maintain contact. Hoddish had alerted the missile teams, and there was little else they could do other than proceed with caution and hope for the best. As they cleared the slopes and moved out onto the flat base of the depression, Sof attempted to use his wrist communicator to raise the guard stationed at the temple, but without success. The sun had dipped behind the ridge, and he strained to see the temple clearly in the fading light. The missile team should have been contactable, with even the short-range unit by now, and the colonel feared the worst. Several times as he was descending, he had thought he heard the crack of a lasgun shot from the direction of their goal, once even a faint cry, but against the background noise of battle from over the ridgetop it was impossible to be sure. Sof knew his fears of infiltration to be well grounded, but how much was his proper concern turning to feverish imagination? His mind's eye locked in memory with the eerie stare of the dead sniper he had so luckily managed to defeat, and a brief shiver, owing nothing to the evening chill, ran down his spine. Grimly, he pushed the memory aside and signalled to the other men to increase their separation as they hastened on. The ground was flat at the bottom of the depression, and although still rocky and scattered with clumps of brush, offered little cover compared to the ridge walls. The colonel felt his heart beat faster as they reached the broad paved ceremonial road which led to the temple. Sweat slicked his hands and his eyes scanned each boulder and bush as he prepared to dash across the road. Never had he felt so appallingly vulnerable. Was it even worthwhile attempting to find cover from these fiendish invisible death dealers? He looked over to where Sokov was ready to cover his dash over the road, nodded and ran. The slap of his boots on the paving stones rang in his ears, even over the noise of battle echoing from the ridgetops. And it was with clear relief that he finally dropped into the broad drainage conduit at the far edge of the road. At once, he sprinted further on and took a position to cover Nibath, who was to follow him, and Sokov and Tarsis, who were to advance up the other ditch. The others were across in seconds. Nibaf sprinted over the road and sprang into the trench with the speed and ease of a desert gazelle, and Sof made a mental note to commend Hoddish on his choice of men. The conduits, paved to carry and channel the surging flows of water that accompanied the irregular rains, offered the best chance of a covered approach to the temple. Now dry, their reddish stones warm in the afterglow that had just reached them from the over rim of the bowl, they would provide at least the illusion of concealment while, closer to the temple, the towering sandstone statues erected to the glory of the emperor and the great amongst his children would offer further cover. Sof raised his hands on the torn remnants of his tunic and cautiously jogged forward up the conduit. Suddenly he froze, as there was a dull detonation from somewhere ahead. There was still a constant backdrop of noise from the fighting beyond the ridge behind them, but this explosion had been to the front. The colonel thought of the massive temple doors. A demolition charge? He knew clearly now they would expect no help from the missile team at the temple. 
What were these aliens? How could three of them wipe out an entire anti-aircraft squad with such ease and so silently? Sarf had met one of these devils face to face, and he knew only too well. He attempted to hasten forward, but he felt strangely weak. This was not war as he knew it. Calmly facing the hulking brutality of the orcs, meeting their primitive power and ferocity with nerve and disciplined firepower. Now it was he and his guardsmen who seemed the primitives. The memory of the dead Eldar's remarkable camouflage haunted Sof as he moved on, his eyes sweeping the rocks on either side. How could he hope to spot the enemy? Only luck had saved him before. There was a knot in his stomach, quite different from the normal adrenaline he felt before combat. Sof was a veteran, a cool head, Discipline and training had always carried him through, but now, just as the sweat ran under the high collar of his ceremonial tunic, the first tingling of fear chafed under his normal, tempered resolve. There was a sound ahead. All at once he leapt sideways, sweeping up his lasgun, but it had only been the slight rustling of dead stems and the first stirrings of a light evening breeze. The colonel forced himself to breathe deeply, calm, as he turned to signal the all-clear to Nibath, who followed on and behind. They soon reached the lines of colossal statues which flanked the roadway on its final approach to the temple. Sof had always found the giant figures sculpted stiff in the style of the ancient desert-dwelling ancestors of the Luxurians, the first colonists to be foreboding. Now, looking up at the august images of priests, commanders and dignitaries, he felt not that these pillars of the empire were watching over him, but rather that they held a vague menace frowning disapproval on his unkempt appearance and fast-beating heart. He paused under the enormous stylized feet of the statue of the Adeptus Astartes commander, who had been the first person to set foot on this planet in the time of the Emperor. The evening breeze blew more steadily as it rustled through Soph's tight curls, drying his sweat. He felt chilled. What would that ancient commander have done here? He would have hardly come skulking up a drain, Sof had a sudden mental image of a space marine trying to manoeuvre his bulky power armour up the conduit and, oddly, it cheered him. He suddenly grinned to himself. After all, wasn't the kind of covert approach, lightly equipped, that he was performing exactly how his ancestors would have raided from the cold deserts back on his own homeworld? This land was his to protect now, and he would deal with these vile, alien devils yet. Tradition should be, must be, upheld. He waved his men to continue, and soon they were at the point where the conduit swung to go around the temple. He still felt vulnerable, still felt tense, but the relief he had felt under the statue had not dissipated entirely. They had a plan, if only a rough one. This was the rear of the temple. This was the rear of the temple, the side opposite the building's only entrance. There were probably only three enemy scouts facing them. There was a chance they might be able to dash to the relative shelter of the surrounding portico, and make an attempt on the temple doors. Each of them had his duty and his part to play. And to Sof, duty and a clear role were sacred. He was exceptionally careful as he moved into his covering position, crawling warily up the steep side of the conduit in the shadow of another giant statue. He felt calmer though, and was thankful that his hands were no longer damp with nervous sweat. He checked to his right and saw Nibrath, silently inclining himself into position alongside him. In front of them, across the flagged rear court, the massive octagonal columns of the temple portico rose out of the deep gloom at their base. Predictably, perhaps, he could see no sign of the enemy, but he tensed as he spotted the brutal evidence of their actions. Slumped on the broad steps of the raised portico, leaning back against one of the great sandstone pillars, was one of the missile team. In other circumstances, he might almost have been taken as asleep, but Soph knew better. The aliens had reached the temple, but where were they? The colonel found that his hands had tensed once more, as he waited for Trooper Sokov to make his prearranged dash for the portico. The young soldier had volunteered to make the first advance, and Sof had seen no reason to refuse him. Sokov himself had said, his eyes bright with ardour, that he was the least experienced and most expendable if the aliens had to be drawn into revealing themselves. He was correct, of course, and the colonel wondered if this had been in Hoddish's mind as well when he let the recruit come in the first place, but there was no time for such melancholy thoughts. A soft scrape of stone made Soft turn 
to see Sokov vault out of the ditch on the other side of the road and sprint for the columns. The lad was fast, and had almost reached the steps when he seemed to stumble, and the next second was face down, a small puff of dust rising from the soft thud of his fall, the clatter of his lasgun, a brief underlining of his fate. Sokov himself made no sound. Of the alien sniper, there had been not a trace. Some of Sof's previous feeling of powerlessness returned as he scanned the shadows between the pillars. No sign. He scrutinised each section of the rim of the gently pitched stone flag roof. No sign. There, next, prearranged tactic in the event of the rear being guarded was to wait five minutes and make a concerted rush from three different directions. The colonel glanced to his right to check that Nibaf was moving off, further down the conduit, prior to the charge, but the wiry little man was standing pressed against the wall at the bottom of the ditch. He was signalling frantically for Soft to join him. In spite of his curiosity, Soft forced himself to descend with the greatest of care and crept along in the shadows of the wall, taking pains not to make any sound until he was alongside the guardsman. Nibaf's soft whisper was quick but clear. The alien's not on the roof. It's by the end column on the far side. Where? Can you see him? No. But how can you know? It's where I would be. Nibaf's tone was very matter-of-fact, and he slightly shrugged his shoulders as he spoke, as if to emphasise his own sniper's badge. He continued, The roof's not high enough for a decent view, and to get any kind of shot, it would have to be to the skyline itself. With that ghost suit, it can just stand against a corner column and watch both ways. It's on the far side, because Sokov was almost across before I had a clear shot and dropped him. The guardsman glanced briefly at the timepiece on his wrist, before looking his commanding officer straight in the eye. When the time to charge comes, sir, let Tarsis go alone. It's a terrible risk for the sergeant, but if we watch that end pillar, we'll have the best chance we'll get of nailing the devil. Sof thought to when Sokov had saved his skin earlier that day. The young guard had been aided by the determined charge led by the big NCO, who would even now be working himself into a position to charge the other side of the portico. One of the colonel's saviours was already dead. Was the other to perish too? And to die charging alone without his expected support? All this flashed through the commander's mind, but in the end, all he said, glancing at his own watch, was, Very well, into place, quickly. As fast as caution allowed, he took up his position again, wondering with every cautious movement of his lasgun if a silent death was about to follow. He carefully sighted on the end column, and, seemingly immediately, he heard Tarsus's stentorian shout as he charged from the conduit. A shadow bulged from the pillar, and there was a crack of a lasgun from beside him, even as he fired himself. He took two more shots at the column, but Nibaf was out of the ditch and charging the portico. After a moment, Sof leapt forward too, and the two men reached the columns together. As they dashed into the shadows, they saw Tarsis pulling his bayonet from the fallen Eldar. He looked up, his long scar pale, against his dark skin and the gloom. He had no questions, no reproach or surprise. His quiet, Sir, merely a request for orders. Soft lost no time. Nibaf, far side, Tarsis with me this side. Nibaf's compact form vanished silently into the dimness of the further reaches of the portico, while Sof crept along the temple wall and the sergeant dashed in short sprints between the outside columns. Two filthy alien scouts dead, two left to deal with. There would probably be one at the temple front. Could they somehow spot that alien too? The colonel moved quickly but kept close to the wall. Shaded by the portico, it had captured none of the day's heat and felt chill where he brushed against it. It gave some sense of safety, even if, as Soft grimly reflected, it was purely illusionary security. As they approached the temple forecourt, they moved far more cautiously. Soft crept forward, the corner column as Tarsis moved to drop down the steps and crawl around the front of the building. It was quiet, except for the bearish rustle as the wind tumbled some dead thorn leaves across the flagstones. Tarsis died so quickly that his commander barely noticed. The colonel heard a slight hiss and then a series of thumps as the big sergeant's body tumbled down the steps. Heart in his mouth, Soft pressed his back to the pillar and stood immobile. Where was the devil? 
He dared not move and tensed against the cold stone. He stared across at the shining doors of the temple. One had been blasted with some kind of alien demolition charge, a surprisingly neat hole blown clean through it. The other remained intact, still glowing in all its glory, reflecting what little light there was left. Soph was surprised at how effective a mirror it made, and, suddenly hopeful, he scanned it for any sign of the alien. But he could see nothing other than the leaves, scraping in fits and starts over the stone as the wind caught them. They blew fitfully, barely moving, occasionally lodging against the column base. Or, why had those leaves stopped when others close by were still moving? There was no stone to stop them. The colonel's heart skipped a beat. It must be the Eldar scum. He stared at the reflection, desperately trying to make out even a hint of the shadowy outline he had been able to see up on the slopes when he had tackled the first scout. The reflection was too poor, but he had a reasonable idea of where his enemy crouched. With a shock, colder than the stone at his back, Sof realised that in turn, the Eldar knew exactly where he was. Even now, his enemy was probably studying his reflection, waiting for him to move. The commander had never felt so hopeless, but the solid knot of anxiety in the pit of his stomach was hardening further to become a clenched mass of frustrated rage. He would have to try his luck. Perhaps his attempt would distract the alien enough for the wily Nibaf to nail it. He stared at the reflection and prepared to move. Not normally religious, Sof surprised himself by mentally intoning a prayer to the Emperor that came back to him from his childhood. Then he lunged. Swinging round the column, he let loose a volley of lasgun shots with cracks echoing wildly off the stone and the vicious red stabs tearing the gloom. There were further thuds and the clatter of falling arms. Astonished, Sof realised he was still alive and that, from the outline he could now see sprawled over the flags, his enemy was dead. He fired a further shot into where he could see the fallen alien's head was and, as the echoes died, he cried out to Nibaf, but there was no answer. Where was the final scout? Deep within the temple, or, alerted by the noise, hurrying to stalk them? Where, for that matter, was Nibaf? There was another of the colonel's soft hisses of irritation as he strode forward. The irritation vanished in an instant as he stepped clear of a pillar and saw Nibaf's body. The soldier lay face down, his lasgun under him. It was he, not Sof, who had distracted the alien at the crucial moment. Abruptly, the colonel turned on his heel and plunged through the blasted temple entrance. Immediately inside the great doorway, Sof leapt to one side and took cover behind one of the double row of pillars which mirrored those of the exterior. His eyes took a moment to adjust to th as the interior was brighter than the evening shade of the portico. It was not glaringly lit, but Sof lights, carefully hidden amongst the carved reliefs of the higher walls, gave out a gentle glow. The long hall that comprised the bulk of the temple was flagged with the same worn sandstone as outside and seemed completely empty. Cautiously, Sof surveyed the chamber. It was a plain room, without furnishings, only the pillars breaking the view to the end. Even the carvings were subdued, seeming as natural as the grain in the stone itself. All seemed clear, and he began to jog to the end where he knew an antechamber gave access to a stairway which led to the control room for the irrigation system as well as to the passage and cells of the priest's quarters. He felt a curious confidence. He had always liked the building, not from any particular spiritual motivation, but for its lack of ornamentation and the manner in which it blended the imperial discipline so dear to him with the shadowy past of the desert peoples of this world. If he was to face such a lethal foe as these aliens, here was a suitable battleground. That he was to face the third Eldar was clear as he approached the antechamber. Its door had been forced, and from somewhere down the stairs, he could hear the sounds of a struggle. He quickened his pace, while still trying to move as quietly as possible. The steps down were worn and steep, but the lighting was now brighter, and Sof took them two at a time. On the small landing, one doorway, its ancient wooden door closed, led to the priest's apartments. Another entrance its modern steel door, blasted through, led into the control chamber. Lasgun at the ready, the colonel charged through. His quick brain, tuned to action, took in the scene in an instant. The priest, Jarendar, had obviously surprised the alien as it tried to manipulate the irrigation controls. 
The two were now locked in a desperate struggle. The slight form of the elder was backed against the bank of instruments, while the massive priest, his back towards Sof and blocking any chance of a shot, was attempting to crush his squirming adversary. The priest was a powerful man, but for all that, he was no fighter, and just as Sof entered, the foul alien heretic managed to break his hold, draw its last pistol, and fire. The priest died with a grunt, the shot blasted through his chest. His body shielded the alien, and Sof caught only a glimpse of a raised pistol and ghastly, gem-like lenses before there was another spurt of lasfire, and the world went black. Sof was unsure how long he had been unconscious, but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds as, when he came painfully back to his senses, the alien was still working at the irrigation controls. His chest seemed a mass of searing agony, as with blurred eyes, he watched the Eldar working. It was tall yet strong, and even its small movements, as it passed some glowing crystal device over the control panel, seemed to have an inhuman grace about them. The otherworldly effect was heightened by its Camelion cloak, which, even in the stark and brightly lit control room, still broke up its slender form to a remarkable degree. Soft's thoughts were as fuzzy as his vision. He thought he saw Nibaf's body lying next to the dead priest. Had they died? Sokoth and Tarsis too, only for he, himself, to fail. He must try to reach his lasgun. It was just beside him, its stock temptingly near. Could he retrieve it without alerting his enemy? The harrowing vision of the face of the first alien he had killed, the extra blank eye of the pistol wound staring from its forehead, seemed to superimpose itself on the back of the head of the scout working in front of him. It appeared to watch him, daring him to move. He screwed shut his eyes and tried to concentrate, driving the visions from his brain. Racked with pain, the colonel tensed himself and tried to move. The only result was even more agony somewhere under his ribs, and an uncontrollable gasp that hissed from his lips. The alien turned, the strange crystal device still glowing, its strangely sensuous las pistol drawn in a movement of fluid grace. Soft stared helplessly up into the opalescent lenses of the blank mask as the creature walked lightly over covering him with its weapon. It paused and, almost in one movement, a quick flick from one of its gracile boots sent Soph's lasgun sliding well out of reach, and it was back working at the controls. Soph trembled with agony and frustration, but could do nothing. His head felt as if it was swimming from his body in a haze of pain, and his vision seemed to be deteriorating further. He was sure he saw the ghost of Sokoth creeping towards the alien from behind. He wanted to shout at the dead youth, to tell him it was all futile, that the lad had been correct. The aliens were spirits and they could not be thwarted. His lips quivered, but no sound came. Sarkov's wraith was almost upon the Eldar now, and was raising his lasgun to club the scout. The colonel stared at the apparition, his hazy world hovering between dream and reality. Why was this ghost carrying a non-regulation weapon? He would have to discipline it. But somewhere on a deeper and more rational level of his brain, Sof recognised that it was not Sokov's ghost, but the young temple novice Jarandar had talked about earlier, the minor components in the Emperor's plan. The weapon was not a lasgun, but a candlestick. The candlestick came crashing down, just as darkness descended once more on the colonel. This time, his period of unconsciousness must have lasted longer, for when Sof came to again, he was floating up the temple stairs. His head swam. Was his spirit being carried off to the Emperor? A face looked down at him, pallid in the bright lights. Soft recognised the insignia around the face's collar. They were badges of a guard medic. The colonel's eyes flickered and his lips moved soundlessly as he tried to speak. The medic, concerned clear in his dark eyes, addressed him firmly. Don't talk, sir. You're badly wounded, but we'll patch you up. The enemy have been driven back. The reinforcements are here as well, and Captain Hoddish is organising the clean-up operations. Sof weakly shook his head. The pain was terrible, but he felt he must speak. His lips shook, but this time a weak, croaking voice was audible. Warn him. Warn who, sir? The medic frowned, plainly not understanding. Warn Hoddish. Tell him. Tell him to look out for the minor components. Tell him it's the small cogs that count. The medic looked forward to where his companion was lifting the front of the stretcher. I think the colonel's delirious, he said. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little guard tale. There'll be more coming up soon. 
Uh, if you wouldn't mind liking this video, remember to subscribe as well. If you're not subscribing, hit the bell if you haven't already so you get notified of all the new stuff that comes out as it comes out. If you would like to support the channel like these heroes listed here have, then please consider using the links below. You can become a channel member, which gives you some perks on the channel for YouTube, or you can become a Patreon for, for as little as $1. So please consider doing that. Uh, otherwise, if you'd like to share this somewhere, if you've got somewhere to share it, or you know someone who'd like to watch this kind of content, please do that as well. All right, see you again next time, and thanks for watching. Cheers.